All right. Y'all ready to get going tonight? Yeah. All right. Good deal. Y'all have a good time today? Yeah. Okay. Well, as we get going tonight, I want to ask you one simple question. What did y'all talk about today? Jesus. Amen. What did y'all talk about today? Jesus. Amen. That's what we are here to do. That's what we're here to bring uh, to the kids, to the adults, to their families, and, of course, to this area, this part of the world. And as we get going tonight, one of the things we're going to do in every uh, lesson uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is we're going to talk about Jesus. And we're going to talk about particular benefits that we receive from our Savior. And so tonight, uh, the main focus of our lesson is going to be the word rest. Now, when we hear the word rest, I'm sure that's what most of y'all would rather be doing right now. How many of y'all want to go to bed? There you go. That's, I, I'm glad to see honesty is still the policy in ARP. Well, as we talk about rest, yes, we do receive physical rest in Jesus Christ. But, of course, when we talk about rest, we're talking about something vastly more important. And so tonight, I want you to turn with me uh, to Psalm 37, which will be our passage for this evening. And we are going to begin at verse 7 of Psalm 37. Well, as you're turning there, we're going to be reading 7 through 11 tonight. You can hear the word of the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place. But, it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you give your honor and your blessing unto the word that you provided for your covenant people. Dear God, we do pray for the power of the Holy Spirit that you apply these words unto our hearts, both this day and forevermore. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, when I hear words about fretting and anxiousness and worry, it brings me back to the time I was four years old and we were down at Myrtle Beach. Now, how many of y'all spend a good bit of time at Myrtle Beach in the summer? Well, we, we only did for a few years. Did you see my name? Uh, she got the feeling back in 1984 that Myrtle Beach was too big, that it was too busy, and there was too many people there. So we quit going to Myrtle Beach in 1984. And so we moved up the coast, and we started going to Virginia Beach. We went to Virginia Beach from 1984 to about 1989, and guess what happened? That's right. My nanny started fretting and complaining that there were too many people at Virginia Beach. Too much going on, it was getting too big, and there was too much traffic and all that kind of stuff. So, <coughs> guess what? We moved further up the coast. And from 1989 until 1997, uh, we went to Ocean City, Maryland. And my nanny never complained about Ocean City, Maryland, because any of y'all ever been there before? Well, not very many people have either. <laughs> that's the that's beauty of Ocean City. You know, Ocean City was still kind of that place that you know some people remember about the beach, where there's just some houses, might be a couple fish restaurants, and that's about it. Now, that's how my grandma defined the word rest. Was lack of human beings and the lack of cars. Now Amen. 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 That's right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's, fitting that somebody from due west would say amen to that. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about what we have before us today in Psalm 37 is this is a Psalm of David. And it's a Psalm of David written in a time of his life where he knows nothing about the word rest. 
This is in a series of songs that are penned by David when he is running from Saul. Now, anybody tell me what Saul was trying to do to David? That's right, he was trying to kill him, trying to put him to death. Now, any particular reason why Saul wanted to kill poor David? He was scared of him. Right? Now, what reason did Saul have to be scared of David? You remember, and you know, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible for this reason, right? Because what we know about Saul is that he was handsome, he was tall, he was broad-shouldered, and he was the perfect man. However, how does the Lord describe David? He was ruddy-looking, and most importantly, he was short. And as somebody who uh, sits on the other end of the scale from most people, you know, I like the fact that short people get less than the Bible. <laughs> now, David also had something that Saul didn't have. That was far more important and far more serious than uh, a little vertical blessing. It was the fact that he was at rest in the Lord. You see, Saul was troubled by everything around him. He was troubled by the enemies of God. He was troubled by his own soul because he had no place to rest. He looked and he looked and he looked in his life for somewhere to rest and there was no place to be found because he was looking in all the wrong places. Or he was looking at his own heart, he was looking at his own uh, mind, he was looking at his own wisdom, his own strength, his own power. And sometimes he even looked at God for him. But Samuel reminded young Saul that the problem is, is he only came to God when he needed something. He only came to God when he had gone through all the other things and thought that God would then answer his prayers. And of course, in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel makes it clear to Saul that he's run out of time. He's run out of opportunity. He has shown himself to be not just a false testifier, but he has lost the kingship that God had given to him. And that's really, of course, why Saul was afraid of David. Because David had something that Saul would never have, which is resting in the promise that God had given unto him. And it wasn't a fact that God had made a promise to David that he would be king, because if we know anything about the story of David, did he have peace in his time as king? It seems like every, every time David turned around, either he had caused a problem or somebody else had caused a problem in the kingdom. You know, David spent his whole life, in a sense, physically on the run from somebody. Whether it was Saul, whether it was his own sin, or whether it was Absalom. Even at the end of his life, you remember David uh, made a, a bad decision. He decided to count the number of people who were in Israel. And you know, when we read that passage, it seems kind of strange, right? Why, why would that be a problem? David counting the number of people. Isn't that something kings should know? I guess it's been about four years when all of us went through that here in America, right? What do they call that? A census, right? Now, anybody come to your house and ask you questions that the government probably don't need to know? <laughs> yes, I'm sure it's the government came by. Now, why does the government need to know that? That's a good question itself. That's, that's another talk. Another <laughs> time. But the idea here is that David comes unto us and tells us in verse 7 of Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that word fret. Now, those of y'all play guitar, right, that word has a little bit different meaning. But what does a fret do on a guitar? That's right. Yeah, it helps out the playing of the guitar, right? So it's a good thing in, in that regard, but when we're talking about 
about it in regards to the Bible, it's a bad thing. Right? To fret means to be anxious and worry about things that you should not be being worried and anxious about. It means that you are forgetting and forsaking the promise that God made unto you that He would be your God forever. And that He had become your God, not by any choice that you made, but by the sovereign grace of His will, of His purpose from before the foundation of the world. And what it means to be at rest in Jesus Christ, what it means to be at rest in our Heavenly Father, in the Holy Spirit, is to remember, first of all, who you are and who God is. That's one of the reasons why David here tells us in verse 7 to rest in the Lord. Now, in your Bibles, and I'm sure your preachers have told you this, and your, uh, you know, your youth leaders and your mom and dad and everybody, but when you read in the Bible, Lord capitalized, L-O-R-D, what does that represent? The covenant name of God. And so every time you see the covenant name of God, what are you supposed to remember? That you belong unto Him. That He has made a promise unto you. And what do we know of our God? He keeps His promises. Because He's God. And what are you? You're not God. You are the creature and He is the Creator. And so when the Creator of the heavens and the earth makes a promise unto you, He doesn't just make a promise unto you for a season. Because God don't think like that, and God don't operate like that, right? God operates in the eternal you know, nature of His own mind. And so God doesn't even understand this idea of fret, of worry, of anxiety, because as we may or may not have sang with the children today, what has He got in His hand? The whole world. And guess where you live? In the world. So if God has the world in his hands, what else he got in his hands? He's got you in his hands. So if he is in control of the big things, the universe, the stars, the planets, uh, the oceans, the mountains, the rivers, all that stuff, then what reason do you have to be anxious or to fret over the things of this life? Again, that's what it means to rest in the Lord. It means to remember who God is is. But remember, who, who are we mainly concerned about talking about today? Jesus. And so we think about how does this especially apply to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember, what has Jesus done for you? What is the primary thing that Jesus has done for you? He died on the cross for your sins. He was born of a virgin lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and was raised on the third day. And we believe that the Scriptures teach uh, that He did that in order that you might be at rest. That you might no longer be in rebellion against God. You might no longer be running to and fro, worried and anxious about the judgment due unto you for sin. Think about all the passages in Scriptures that talk about people who fret and are anxious and are worried about their transgressions before God. What do they constantly do? They run and they hide. We see Adam and Eve in the garden do that, do we not? When they realize God is walking in the midst of the garden, and of course whenever we hear that language, right, that God is walking upon the earth, who are we meant to think about? What's the answer that preachers always want to hear? Jesus. Jesus, right? Because when we think about Jesus, we remember He's not only the divine uh, second person of the Holy Trinity, what did He take on? Flesh. He is God incarnate, is the big fancy word that, that preachers like to use, right? And if He is walking in the midst of the garden, coming unto Adam and to Eve, and they're not dead yet, what does that mean? It means that He's about to show some mercy on them. Right? He's about to shower His grace upon them, and that's exactly what we see happen in the garden. He comes upon them, yes, they receive a curse, yes, they receive uh, the temporal judgment of death, just as 
uh, was promised unto them if they ate of the fruit of the tree. But you remember in that story, as, as God is bringing His discipline, His judgment upon those whom He loves, He gives them a promise. Right, Genesis 3.15 tells us that out of Eve will come a seed. And who is the seed? Jesus, right? Jesus is the seed. And so as humanity grows, as wickedness grows, as evil grows, as all these things come to pass throughout the history of God's people, what is it that allows men like Noah, men like Moses, men like David, women like Ruth, women like Deborah, women who have given unto the Lord their peace, uh, to be at rest in the midst of all the evil that they see. It's exactly what David's speaking about here in Psalm 37. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Now, how long ago did David live? Anybody want to do some math in their head real fast? <laughs> a long time ago, right? Now, How long ago did Jesus walk the earth and how long ago was it when He died for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead? 2000, some odd, well, 1998 or whatever the year is. I, I went to West Virginia Public Schools. You have to excuse me on that. Um, but the idea is, is that all the people who have gone before us, what have they been doing? They've been waiting patiently on the Lord. And has the Lord been faithful to them? Has the Lord kept His promises unto them? Amen and amen they have. Rest in the Lord, wait patience for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospered in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers should be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And that is the promise, that is the assurance that we have in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and when He ascended into heaven, what did God the Father give unto Jesus? All that He promised. And guess what that included? The whole world. And so if the whole world is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you live in this world, and you have received the promises of the Gospel, and you have been given the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the wisdom of the truth of our God, and you read here in this passage, for evildoers be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Guess what you have inherited? The earth. It belongs unto you. Now, when we hear that, right, that sounds really strange because uh, I live in a manse. Now, does anybody know what a manse is? Right, that's where preachers live, right? And guess what that means? That means I don't own any land, right? I don't own anything. I live in my house next to Bethany Avenue Church. Now, uh, my daughter over here just turned 18, and uh, I told her, a joke with her, that when she turned 18, I was going to start charging her rent. Uh, live in the house. However, my daughter is smart. She takes after her mother. And she reminded me that we live in a manse. And that I don't have any authority to charge rent for her. But I keenly reminded her of this thing called subletting. And uh, we, uh, we got talking about that. But, right, you think about inheriting the earth. Right? What does it mean to inherit the earth? It means that you, as a son and daughter of the living God, are a king over the earth. Now, that sounds really weird, doesn't it? Because what the kings do, they're in charge. And you, who are a son and daughter of the living God, who have inherited the earth, have you had any reason to fear, to fret, to worry, to be anxious about the wickedness of this present world? No. Because it has no authority over you. 
It has no power over you. It has no ability to harm one hair on your head. Because who do you belong to? Jesus. You belong to the King of Kings. You belong to the Lord of Lords. The Prince of Peace. The Wonderful Counselor. The Almighty God. And that, again, is what it means to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to understand in the depths of our soul that we not just belong unto Him as some kind of side thing. You know, Jesus isn't carrying us around in a, in a purse or a satchel or, uh, you know, one of them things people wear at the beach. Uh, a fanny pack. I couldn't remember what that thing to call. Right? A fanny pack, right? You belong unto Him and you are his. That's why we see here after that verse 9 it says for yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed you will look carefully for his place. Now without getting myself in too much trouble uh, there's a big word that I like to uh, testify that I believe in and, and, and Mr. Jordan is going to probably fall out and see when I say this but I'm a post millennialist. I believe that these things are going to happen in history in real life. That Christ's kingship and His power over things is going to be seen. And that's something, again, we see here in the testimony of Psalm 37. If you let a while, the wicked should be no more, and you will care for His place. Now, how does this come to pass? It comes to pass when the church believes in the power of Jesus Christ believes in the authority of the message that we've been given to proclaim unto sinners. One of the reasons I think the church struggles so much today is that we don't believe in the power. We don't believe in this authority that we have been given by our Savior. Because when we tell people to believe in Jesus, when we tell people to rest in Christ, we are offering them something that they can get nowhere else. Because it only comes from Jesus. It only comes from the good word that we've received from our Heavenly Father. Now, uh, one of the things that I've done with my kids over the years is I I've taught them the shorter catechism. You know, we've gone through the catechism in family worship, uh, and, you know, and I've been more and less faithful uh, to that over the time. Uh, I will, I'm receiving looks right now from uh, this side of the room. But in question 86 of the Shorter Catechism, it says this. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered to us in the Gospel. Let me repeat that real quick. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered to us in the Gospel. Now the Gospel simply put is this, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. That you have nothing within yourself to recommend you to a heavenly and a righteous God. But the good news is you have not been left in such a state. But... The very Son of the living God has come and He has laid down His life. He has given of Himself. He has fully fulfilled the law and He has died on the cross. And you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that being washed in the blood of the Lamb, you are no longer dead, but you are alive in Jesus Christ. And if you are alive in Jesus Christ, you are alive in Him forever. And the more we rest, the more we understand what that means, the less and less the wickedness and the evil of the things of this world will cause us to fret, cause us to be anxious, cause us to be worried. Because when we see the enemies of God act, we know that they have no power. They have no power over us. They have no power over the church. They have no power, most especially, over Jesus Christ our Savior. And that's why we proclaim the good news of the gospel with such joy in our hearts. Because that's really what resting is, isn't it? You know, Presbyterians don't need to be dour all the time. It's okay for us to tell people that we enjoy being a Christian. 
it's okay for us to, 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 to be happy in church. And it's okay for us to, 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 to hear the gospel and say amen to the good word that we have heard. You know, it's one of the things I like about coming to Appalachia, and I especially enjoy uh, on the Lord's Day, is being in a missionary Baptist church where they believe the gospel. And they show it. Now, I don't mean we need to be bouncing around and running around in our churches. I don't want to hear from your pastor about, you know, Ben Glasser told me in Appalachia that, you know, I'm allowed to jump and shout at Neely's Creek or whatever. But it does mean that as we go out and do the work that God's called us to do as His covenant people, that we do so resting in Jesus Christ. Because He is our power. He is our Lord. He is our being this day and forevermore. And so as you go out tomorrow, as you teach the kids about Jesus Christ, believe in Him. Rest in Him. Do not fret. Do not be worried. Do not be anxious. Remember, He's got the whole world in His hand. And you're in the world and you will never be cast out. Because He is God this day and forevermore. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the day and for the time you give to us to be in Your presence. And to God, we ask that you would continue to help us to see the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the forgiveness of sins, the beauty of our Savior, that we might begin rejoice and give thanks and be at rest, both this day and forevermore. In our Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.